Okay. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. David Ajibadi with the Brain and Body Foundation, and we are back with Professor Angela Taylor, who had a child. She's a professor of nutrition and dietitian, right? That, that, dietetics? Is that correct? Yes, I'm, a, I'm a licensed dietitian nutritionist, and I teach now at Johns Hopkins University and wow. at Brooklyn College and at NSU Patel School of Medicine down in Florida. That's got to be online for the Florida one, right? Yeah, Brooklyn and, and Florida are both online because I live in Baltimore. So Okay, so you can just drive over to Johns Hopkins University. Wow, I, I think this is, nutrition is such an important topic. Uh, unfortunately, in medical school, we were not taught anything about, well, I mean, if, if, if knowing that vitamin deficiencies such as scurvy, scurvy is nutrition, then I guess we're taught about vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies. But in terms of a functional, um, um, holistic approach to nutrition and seeing how nutrition can be used both as an adjunct and as a therapy. Uh, it's, it's totally foreign to us. And it, unfortunately, I, I can say it still is sort of foreign to, to experts and uh, specialists in the field of medicine because it's like, what does, what does nutrition have to do, to do with it? Absolutely nothing, right? And that is unfortunately the fallacy because we're seeing more and more how nutrition works. And we are seeing, in your case, how you use nutrition and, of course, the ABA and the other therapies to help your child who had diagnosed, was diagnosed with autism at the age of three years. Yes? He was a little under three. So let's say, let's call it two years, 10 months. About two years, 10 months. And as we all know, once you get a diagnosis of autism, you do not lose that diagnosis. Yeah, 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 yeah. Branded autistic for life. But you kind of disproved that, didn't you? Well, I think we did. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that's a huge testament. So I know you said a few things in the first uh, session uh, that we, we have our first discussion about some of the things that you had to, that you noticed in James. How old is James now, by the way? He's fifteen. Fifteen. That's what I thought. So. Let's take it back to see what are the other things you noticed? Stimming and he was nonverbal. What else? Well, you know, he also would sometimes bang his head on the ground. Luckily, we do have carpet in our house, so it wasn't as bad as it could be. Um, I asked at the time, I asked his physician about it, and she thought that it was because he was frustrated. So, um, you know, I, I can't speak to why any other child might do that behavior, but she thought that's why our child would do it sometimes. He also would um, line up, he's really into trains and he would line up all of his trains in a row. Um, he also learned his letters and numbers at a very young age and he would put them all in order, the proper order in a very perfect line. So those are all kind of hallmarks of autism. Right, did, did you like spinning objects? I don't remember that, um, but I know it's very common for children with autism to pick up a, a, like a toy train or car and just like spin the wheels instead of playing with it appropriately, so. How about uh, in terms of emotional outbursts, laughing un inappropriately, uh, screaming and shouting inappropriately, was that ever seen with him? We were fortunate that we really didn't have those problems, but I do know what you're referring to because um, children who have a high fungal load will sometimes do the laughing inappropriately. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. yep, yep, yep. How about um, air, air infections? Any air infections, tonsil infections? He did have one ear infection and, uh, you know, and I'm a licensed dietitian nutritionist. I wasn't licensed dietitian nutritionist at the time. I went back to school after he was recovered, uh, but I was still always very interested in nutrition. So when the, when the pediatrician prescribed antibiotics for him, I was like, Hmm, do I really want to do this? And so I gave him one dose of the antibiotic and then I, I said, no, we're just going to have to fix this another way. So we, he's only taken one antibiotic pill his entire life. Wow. That's amazing. That is amazing. Yeah. So, okay. So, um, how about potty training? Was there a delay? I know he's your, your first and only child. Or was there, there was any, a delay. Yes, was a delay. there was. Okay. 
Well, we, uh, we were very fortunate that we found someone who, speci who specialized in autism and one of her little niche things that she was good at was helping with potty training. So she helped us a lot. So that was incredibly uh, helpful. with us how she did that? I mean, what, what were the things that they put in place for that? Dr. David, I'm so sorry that that was a long time ago. I mean, he's 15 now, so I don't remember, but I'm sure that there must be someone on the internet by now who has written a book on how to teach your child, to, how to potty train your, your special needs child that someone could look up. So that would be great because we had to pay kind of a lot of money to this person. So I think it would be good if you can find an online resource to refer people right, to. Right, because one of the things we, we saw, I mean, uh, like I told you, we have patients coming in and they're like, they take the child and try to, they know the child wants to go to the bathroom, they take him or her to the bathroom and he refuses to sit on the, on the commode. He decides on his own to go and poop in the corner. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes you find he goes or she goes into the closet and poops and rather than going to the bathtub, sometimes there's fecal smearing involved yeah. where, where the child wants to touch this. So all kinds of crazy stuff going on. Mm -hmm. uh, with this. And this, yeah, this I think, I think, Dr. David, a lot of it comes back to them not understanding, right? You know, mm -hmm. they just don't understand what they're supposed to do because their brain isn't working. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I forgot to mention in our previous segment, and so I really want to make sure that I get to it, is that in addition to doing the gluten-free, casein-free, so that's dairy-free diet, we also supplemented with a lot of fish oil because omega-3s, uh -huh. Yeah, omega-3s are really important for brain development. So it's really important, I think, to set your kiddo up nutritionally so that the brain has the ingredients that it needs so that then now their brain, the lights are on so you can teach them. And there is actually another really great book that I, was, I remember using called How Do I Teach This Kid? And this was yeah. also something that I used in, at the ABA table. Kimberly Henry, is that what we have there? Yeah, Kimberly A. Henry is the, is the yeah. author. Okay, yeah, I see that. So yeah, so so you gotta you gotta make the brain receptive. Um, we did a little bit of homeopathy. Um, mm -hmm. So if you can find someone who is knowledgeable about that, that could be helpful. And then we also did some chiropractic. But honestly, t his recovery was mainly with the food and the omega threes and the ABA for that first year, you know, okay. then we added in a bunch of other stuff to really catch him up to where he was supposed to be right. after that. So, so just to say a little bit about the omega threes, I, I gotta say that's probably one of the best things you can give a child's brain uh, because uh, one, if you, 60% of the, of the brain's weight, 60% of it is made up of fat. And of that, so that number, about 40% is made up of the omega threes. So it's, it's omega threes play a huge role, a huge part in the structural component, but also in terms of inflammation. So a lot of kids with um, autism and other neurodevelopmental problems have higher levels of brain inflammation and omega threes help to quell that storm. They help to douse the flames of inflammation. And so once, once you're able to douse the flames, I've, I've had patients who uh, they, they were taking a certain dose of omega threes, and I asked them to increase it. And it's like when they increased it, they found out that kids were now talking more because they were having the right uh, a better dose to help douse the flames to calm the brain down. And that's what what omega three does, in addition to other things as well. So having a really good quality omega three is super important. Yes. So uh, let's talk about that real quick. There are plant based omega threes, but they don't work as well. So for example, chia seeds are a great plant source of omega-3s, but these don't work nearly as well as fish-based omega-3s. Or if you get animal products from animals that only ate grass, so we call that pasture-raised or grass-fed, those animals will also have a, a pretty good omega-3 profile. But honestly, the very best omega-3 source you could possibly get is eating fish or taking fish oil if, if fish oil is available to you. Yeah. The challenge with fish is that a lot of them are laden with toxic, with uh, mercury and other heavy metals now. And you, you have do you find go that in, Dr. David, do you find that to be true even in catching fish from the rivers in Nigeria? Do you know? If they're, if they're from the fish, if they're from the rivers, yeah, that's less of a problem. But most fish you get is, have been farm raised. So they have a lot of toxins. 
I don't know what it is in the US, but I, I would assume that you, most of your fish is farm raised as well. You need the wild, the wild one, the wild fish, especially like the Alaskan salmon, which kind of runs the bill, <laughs> your bill a little higher, higher too. So I, I mean, I, if we're going to use it for a therapeutic reason, I would say you got to get a good quality omega-3 supplement because that's, that reduces the risk of, of the other problems. And you can't have them eating fish every day anyway, so but you've got to maintain that dose. So um, yeah, great. So we talked about omega-3s, we talked about um, gluten-free and casein-free. Um, so tell me about some of the best meals that you've, you, um, I know there's a whole wide range and your book has a lot of that, but I'm sure I would guess that there might be some that you've seen better results with than others. Any you want to highlight? Well, Dr. David, in terms of palatability, like what my son liked, um, yeah. that's maybe, I couldn't really tell you what meals in particular made his recovery better because that would be kind of a long trajectory. It's not like I gave him, you know, salmon one night and the next day he was talking, you know, in paragraphs. Okay. It didn't really, I didn't notice that. Okay. But in terms of what he liked, that was the whole point of my book was that I started off, um, you know, I stand on the shoulders of giants. I didn't invent this particular diet that we followed. We actually followed a very, a very strict diet that was stricter even than gluten-free, casein-free. It was actually entirely grain-free. So um, that's, and it was called the specific carbohydrate diet or another name for that. People call it the GAPS diet, which stands for gut and psychology syndrome. Or another name for that is the paleo diet. So you can see here, I have them all, all three of them listed here on the front of the book, SCD, GAPS, and paleo. They're all pretty much the same thing. All right. So, um, so there were some recipes in some of the books that I got you know, that told me about the SCD and the gaps in paleo, but I need recipes that a kid will eat, that a kid would like. And so that is why I took all of my family's favorite recipes that contained wheat. And I kind of like translated them into grain-free versions. Mm. So, so there's like chicken nuggets in here. Um, we would just eat hamburgers without the bun. Um, I would make cakes and cookies that didn't, like I would make them out of like seeds or nuts instead of out of wheat, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, once I figured it out, it's like anything new, you know, the first time you do it, it takes longer, but after right. you get the hang of it, it's a piece of cake, it's no big deal, so. Right, what, what, what do you say about sweet potatoes? Well, that's tricky. Um, you know, if you're gonna go really strict and go do the specific carb carbohydrate diet or the GAPS diet, once again, I'm just gonna hold this up so you guys know what I'm saying here, SCD or GAPS, then sweet potatoes are disallowed. They're not allowed, okay? But, um, you know, maybe like, after you've done some recovery, good. after you've seen some recovery, yeah. then then that might be okay. Here's kind of the, the theory of, of why these different rules were made, okay? Um, if the patient, the young patient, the child, has dysbiosis. So if they have a lot more bad bugs in their gut than good bugs, so that, that means a disordered microbiome in their gut. Right. And when they eat these foods that take longer to digest, that contain complex carbohydrates, mm -hmm. they will end up fermenting and feeding the bad bugs. Right. So that is the theory behind this SCD, which stands for specific carbohydrate diet, is that we're feeding the child, the patient, foods that are more easily digested, that are less likely to ferment, that are less likely to feed the bad bugs. Mm. So that's the tricky thing about potato, sweet potato in particular. Um, white potatoes are worse. Sweet potatoes are easier to digest. Um, so one thing we haven't really talked about too much is that I believe that you also need to address your kiddo's microbiome. Yes. Thank you. Mustn't forget that. <laughs> yes. So that that's a tricky thing that I don't think science still has not does not have a definitive answer on the best way to do that, but we're trying. Okay. So there's the four R's. Let me see if I can remember them. Um, we have reduce. Um. Mm, all right. I have to look them up. They're right here on my screen. So let me get them for you. Okay. Okay. 
Here we go. I got it. Luckily, okay. I have it here at the ready. Okay. All right. I'm going to share my screen. All right. Sure I don't have any uh, personal. I don't. Okay, good. All right. Here we go. All righty. So we have remove. So we need to remove the things that are um, affecting the gut, such as the inflammatory foods, but then also any infections that they have. Okay. And then we need to restore the environment. And then we need to re-inoculate. So we need to put some good probiotics back in there. And then we need to repair the gut lining. So those are the four R's, remove, restore, re-inoculate and repair. Mm. Yeah. I like it. I like it. So interesting. Yeah, can we, can we I'll camp up on this for a little while here? Uh, because I'm a big proponent of probiotics and I've seen the, the difference they make in, in my practice as well. You want to talk about that? Do you use probiotics or is it strictly from the foods? Um, yeah, I mean, you can use fermented foods and that's a great way for people who don't have access to buy probiotics. You can basically make your own by fermenting things like um, cabbage or what, what are some popular fermented foods that you have in Nigeria, Dr. David? Uh, it's, it's the only one I can think of is the milk, milk-like ones. Uh, that is a no-no for, uh, for, um, for children with autism. I don't think we do much of fermented stuff in, in Nigeria much at all, but like I said, it's, it's mainly the, the milk containing. So like uh, yogurt and kefir, stuff like that. You know, you can ferment breast milk. You okay. can just take, you, so the mom could, could express her breast milk, okay? And she could make yogurt out of it, basically, breast milk yogurt. That would be so good, so amazing for her child. That's going to be a bit of a stretch, though, except that's only if she's had another child. Uh, well, no, breast- if you keep the milk supply going. I breastfed James for a long time. Now, that might be part of why he recovered, too. I don't know. But if you, till he was four. No way, really? Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, if you think about the biology of it, you're supposed to keep breastfeeding your child until they lose their milk teeth, right? Until they lose their front teeth. Wow. So so if they just, you know, somehow find a way to keep expressing their milk, if, if you have access to a breast pump, that's the easiest way, but it is possible to hand express milk and then ferment it. You know, using some sort of starter culture would be great. Um, if you can at least get your hands on a bottle of, or even a single probiotic pill, that is the type of probiotics that you want, maybe like some bifidobacteria would be great. You can use that as starter culture and then just keep it going if you know how to make yogurt. Hey, okay. that, that, that's interesting. And I see you have here, you have here repair, it says leaky gut revive. Is that, is that a supplement? Oh yeah, that's a commercial product. Now, of course, that's, I would love for everyone in Nigeria to have that product, but you know, they're probably not going to have access to it. So, um, you know, perhaps they could grow some aloe. That's easy. Aloe grows like crazy everywhere. Right. So. Right. right. And then you need to start prepare it. And, and like what we, what we try and do is if I, if I, if I can identify a product that works really well, and, I, and people I know have used, people I know and trust have used it and they've seen the results on their kids, on their patients, I will get them and send them back to Nigeria. So make that, make that available to our people in Nigeria. So, so I'm always on the lookout for it. Obviously not everybody can afford it, but that's uh, another story in itself. So that's interesting. So, so you use this with James, yes? I did not use this particular product. It wasn't available then. But I did use um, various things to try and and heal his gut. And in fact, I have a whole list. And by the way, we didn't stay dairy free for very long. I will tell you, you know, true confessions, what we actually did. I did go dairy free for a little while because this is what the doctor wanted us to do. But I found actually that by taking that source of good probiotics away, Dr. David, shall I... um, Shall I stop sharing the screen or? Yeah, I was going to, I was about to say that. Yeah. Okay. All right. Great. Um, can, can you just, uh, okay, well, they can screen grab, that. screenshot. Yeah. So, and, and then they can just go to this leaky gut revive page and read all about it if they want to. Um, yeah. But um, I found that we were like catching colds if we didn't um, have our kefir every day. So um, do people know what kefir is, do you think in Nigeria? No, they don't. Okay. Well, it's kind of like yogurt. 
but it it's not as sweet. It's like mm -hmm. I would use unsweetened and um, it has actually a lot more probiotics in it. Like yogurt might only have like four strains in it, but kefir tend to have like 13 different strains in it. Okay. Right. And you can make it yourself, but you just have to look up how to make kefir on the internet. It's very easy. Um, so I would make our own kefir from raw milk. Okay. So I would get unpasteurized milk from my farmer. I have a special farmer who I have a good connection with who keeps a very clean farm. So in his, he tests his herd to make sure there's no illness in his cows because you don't want raw milk from a sick cow. That's for sure. Okay. So he would test his cows frequently to make sure they were, they were healthy. Um, and another interesting thing is that these particular cows were A2. So there's a difference. There's A1 milk and there's A2 milk. Okay. And the A1 milk tends to have more of an opiate effect in the brain, whereas the A2 milk has less of an opiate effect in the brain. I won't bore you with the science. I'm just giving you the facts, okay? So I, it was raw, unpasteurized A2 milk from a clean farm that I turned into kefir. I and we did, I did give him that every day. Every day. And he took it because uh, that's another challenge. Kids taking... Un I blended it. Yeah, I blended it in the blender with a banana. You could use any sweet fruit. Yeah. Okay. 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 So that, that helps. That helps. So so um, so what, what's your stance when it comes to fruits? Because some people say, well, some fruits they have sugar, they're gonna they're gonna cause them to dim or become hyperactive and all that. What what do you say? Well, it's true that fruits do have sugar, but they also have fiber. Mm -hmm. So um, tropical fruits are kind of the hardest, I think of the sort of sugar to fiber ratio, you know? So, um, you know, I might use like half a banana when I was making James's kefir shake, you know? Okay. Um, and I probably wouldn't use, I wouldn't give him like a whole pineapple to eat, no way, okay? But um, berries or if your child likes berries, if you have access to them, mm -hmm. then then berries are great. But if you don't, then use whatever fruit you have in, in moderation, so. Okay. Um, I was going to ask this question too. Um, yeah, so speaking about pro probiotics, so we, we, we found one with a, a lab. They, they don't even sell to the public. So fortunately, we were able to register with them and they have the 12 strains plus, and then they got this 50, 50 billion CFUs. But what I liked about this was that they are known as a probiotic company. That's what they do. And then, so the probiotics also are formulated in a way that they um, they, they 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 survive the, the that treacherous journey from the mouth to the, the large intestine, but also they also have able to attach to the walls of the large intestine and reproduce and multiply, which is something most of the probiotics cannot do. They they just they, they don't come with that ability to latch onto the wall, which is a very important thing as well. Um, well, it took us a while, I got to tell you, Professor Taylor, Taylor, took us a while to find that, that one. But once we found it, and once we, knew, we now found out that if we even increase the dose, it worked even better. People, they, their parents reported to us that the, the kids were speaking more when we increased the dose. They were, were more attentive, they were more focused and all that. So, so all these things are really, really important. Just all these clues and nuances. We've been at this for over five, six years. So you've been at it for, for obviously much, much longer than, the, than that. But these are all very, very important tips and uh, uh, the learning process. So, so I really appreciate this. Um, Dr. David, what's the name of your probiotic? I'd love to read more about it. It's, uh, it's called um, High Potency Probiotic from a lab called UAS Labs, but they don't sell, they don't sell um, retail. So you got to have a registration, I guess, because I was, I'm a doctor and, and all that. They sell specifically to all, to large organizations. So I, okay. we, in fact, we had the lowest they sell is uh, 250 bottles. I had to go, that's, a, that's the least amount they will sell. So, so we, we had to, but what I did was that I, I reached out to my patients and I said, well, this is a really good probiotic. I've done a lot of research on it. Um, would you like to have it? And I, I had them pay up front and of course give them the, the discount. So, we, so when we were able to get us, I think we had about five or six who were interested. When we got that, we now ordered, ordered a large batch. And once we got it, I got to tell you, tell you, it was a game changer. Game changer, yeah. So, so probiotics, uh, um, omega-3 fatty acids, fiber, fermentable fiber, right? Well, you have to be 
a little careful when you're first starting off the SCD, right? If you choose to go that route, the specific carbohydrate diet, that you pick foods that are not going to feed the bad bugs and cause fermentation. So in my book, actually, I have a nice scientific explanation of, you know, why do we pick certain uh, carbohydrate foods because they have a certain structure, okay? Okay. So that's how we make our discernment. And then, but, but I'm not going to ask you to get out your microscope. You know, I'm not going to ask the patient's mom to get out their microscope and figure out what's what. So we actually have a list that we've already made that makes it simple. So the, the list tells you what's allowed and what's not allowed. Okay. So and that's that, what that helps people. Time, right. For the, for the initial period. Um, right. But yeah, for an initial period. I think while you're trying to get the dysbiosis under control, you're kind of starving the bad bacteria. I wouldn't want to stay on this diet forever. It's, it's restrictive. And eventually you want to make sure you're giving fiber to the good bacteria because the, the, the good bacteria need fiber too, you know, but you just, you need to, I feel like if I had known then what I know now, I would have done this diet, but I also would have gone in there with some sort of herbal agent to sort of beat back the bad bugs, you know, because I did not do that, you know, because I didn't know. And I think we would have had even faster, like clostridia in particular is really common with kids with autism. So I've been looking it up in the scientific research. And so far I have found a couple of natural agents that the research has promised. Mm -hmm. So one of them is black seed oil. So, um, Nigella, whatever is the, is the scientific name, but black seed oil is, is what it's known as. I suppose you probably have heard of it. Um, black cohosh is what I, I've heard of. Or black, no, black that seed. is different. That's a different herb. So black seed oil. I think it's Nigella sativa. Okay. Let me look it up real quick. So the literature says that that is effective against clostridia. Yeah. Black seed oil. Black, and it's also known as black cumin seed oil. Okay. Okay. And then another promising uh, natural agent is pomegranate. Now, the paper that I read used an extract of the whole pomegranate. So okay. it was the seeds, the skins, the pith, everything. But if, if all you have access to is pomegranate anneals, which are the little seeds inside the pomegranate, then fine, eat those, put those in a smoothie, okay? You know, mm-hmm. but if you have access to a pomegranate tree or somebody, if you have access to pomegranate extract, okay, then that seemed promising. The thing that's tricky with clostridia is that it makes spores. Mm. And so once this organism makes these little spores and sends them out into the world or into your gut, okay, sends them out into your gut, these little spores are tight little protected balls, basically. They're tough. And Mm. like, you can't burn them, you can't, kill them with antibiotics, like they're protected because they're in this spore form. And so it's really hard to wipe out the spores. So you really have to keep going with this therapy for a while while you wait for the spores to kind of hatch so that you can get them. Mm. And what some people will do is they'll go after the clostridia pretty hard for maybe a couple months. And then they'll switch to something called pulse dosing where they will now bring deliberately bring the therapy back to like every third day okay. where they hit it hard every third day. And then they give it a couple days for the spores to be like, okay, coast is clear. And then some spores will, will emerge and then they hit the spores hard again. Right. So, so that's a couple natural agents that I found. There's also some commercial products that people are using like biocidin is. Biocidin. Yes. That was, I was trying to remember that. Have you tried, mm-hmm. have you tried that? Well, I didn't know about it at the time with James. So, um, but I, if I had known, I would have, yeah. <laughs> so so what, what, I, what I do, well, the first month is all about the guts, really cleansing and pushing everything out. It's actually somebody interesting, the person who introduced you and me, um, introduced us, Shoshana. She was the one who introduced me to this person who, and, and to me, that's been one of the most effective treatments I've ever used uh, against autism, um, children with autism, because, uh, um, for the first one or two months, our focus is on getting them to push out as much as the contents of the gut as possible, get them, get rid of all the bad bugs and all that. And of course, immediately we start putting them, giving them probiotics, but so it would get them 
there was an agent that we would use, a natural agent that we use, that would get them to contract and push that stuff out. And we're going to talk about that afterwards. And then we would, in, we would give them something for the heavy metals to remove heavy metals and, 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 uh, and detox. Then we would use biocidin, then we would use a parasite cleanse as well. So okay. in, in addition to uh, the, the cleansing, so we, we try to hit as many spots as possible. The parasites, the viruses, the, the bacteria, Clostridia, and of course the fungi, um, candid, candida, a lot of them have candida as well. So that would, so after about a, one, one and a half to two months, we saw significant improvements. In fact, that was the biggest jump and everything after that was like an instrumental improvements. But that first two months was dramatic. They would be like kids are turned around, they are hugging their kid, they are hugging their siblings, they are listening to their parents, they're trying to get more involved. And then and they would, they would, they would expect the next few months to see the same amount of it, the same level of jump. And I'd be like, yeah, it may not be, but they would still see some improvements, but it was always. Interesting that that first period was significant. And that's because all that junk, if I may use that term, had been stuck there. And I, all the bad bugs, the dysbiosis had accumulated and were just sitting there and causing all these problems. Once you get them, when we want to get them to flush that out, it's like it just, like you said, just it clears the air, so to speak. It's, it removes the fog. So really good. Just to clarify, Dr. David, um, by flush it out, we're kind of saying like, if they're constipated, maybe we're giving them some like magnesium or something to help them to poop every day. Is that what we're saying? Or is there something else? Uh, one of the things we use is a special kind of vitamin C, not the regular kind of vitamin C. Okay, yeah, very, yeah, okay. Very special, uh, non acidic, very special kinds. Again, you don't want to use regular vitamin C that would just be very caustic. But it's, it's, it's a lot, um, what shall we say, um, 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 not, lost, lot less harsh on the body and they're able to just push stuff out. Key is just to get, that, get them to push that stuff out without it being too harsh on the digestive system on the brain. Uh, we've done it for years now, it works so well. Right. So would that be more of like an ester C or like a, a calcium, as, uh, like a buffered C or? More like a um, sodium ascorbate kind of C. Okay, great. Yeah. yeah. There's a specific brand that we use. And of course, we, uh, sometimes people have to use a lot. So it's not, it's, uh, I mean, you have to walk them through the process and, and, and take them by their hand. But once they get, once they understand it, they, and you have to use it in combination with the other things I mentioned, but once you want to get it right, once they get the, that kid pooping, that's the key, getting them to poop. Because one of the problems with autism, and this goes back to serotonin and goes back to the whole, the whole development of the gut, the neurological development, part of the problem is that they don't have um, the peristalsis, uh, that, that rhythmic motion that pushes stuff through the gut is deficient in most children with autism, whether or not they exhibit digestive symptoms. It's, it's, it's a, they found that it's a lot slower. They don't have as many pulsations as the normal typical kids do. So as a result, stuff gets stuck in their guts and it's hard to get it out. So this is one of the things we do. We just really trigger that whole process. You know, it's interesting because you know, we don't have stool tests on very many of these kids, but Clostridia botulinum is known to sort of shut down peristalsis. So I wonder if maybe they have that. I don't know. Mm, and that could be. That, that too could be. But yes, it, they've, they've looked at the neurological development and they've, they've, they're like, yeah, they've seen this, especially when they've really done research. Like their, their, their serotonin levels were low at a certain point in time. It's higher at diagnosis, but... They, they, what they say is that there was a, was a point in the development of the gut that the serotonin levels were low and therefore they didn't develop as well as they should have. The gut didn't develop as well as they should have and therefore the peristalsis was affected. And, but there's a lot of different things that they're finding out. It's like, <laughs> I mean, they're finding out a lot of things where things go wrong. The challenge is they're not coming up with as many solutions. They're finding out a lot of the problems, but not the solutions like they should. So. And then, of course, they, they are now finding out that so certain um, bugs are missing. So we know the Clostridia, we know the 
candida are missing but they're not being to identify certain bugs. Like for instance, B. fragilis. I don't know if you've heard about that. They found out that B. fragilis is significantly uh, lower in kids with autism. They found out also, I think there's a um, lacto, lactobacillus uh, ruteri, ruteri, R-E-U-T-E-R-I, that found out that also is lacking in autism. And so they're now, I know the people, and actually know the scientists who are now doing studies they're isolating those bugs and they're giving them to mice and giving them to human subjects. And they're seeing significant improvements simply on the basis of giving them uh, ample doses of those bugs, those probiotics. So that's, it's exciting. If we can get them to do it in commercial levels that we can use in Africa, that'll be, that'll be a huge game changer. I wonder if you could crack open a probiotic capsule you know, in your village and use it to make probiotics. This might violate your brand agreement, of course, with the companies selling them to you. So you may or may not be allowed to do that, but I've made yeah. yogurt before from, I've just taken a probiotic capsule and put it into unpasteurized milk uh -huh. or breast milk. And I've made yogurt that way from a, really? from a probiotic capsule. Yeah. So you, okay. So Put it in, in, in the milk, in the, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the unpasteurized milk, probiotics would multiply. Is that what you're saying? Yeah. So you just take an empty mason jar, okay? You put milk in it. Then you take the little probiotic capsule. You just crack it open, shake it in there, stir it up. And then you hold it. And the recipe is in here in my book for making yogurt, okay? You just hold it at 95 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's a very specific temperature for raw milk. It's 95 right. degrees Fahrenheit for 24 hours. And um, so I'm going to look up the centigrade. Um, it has to be in the oven. Be no, the well, it, you would need to heat it in some way. Okay. So, um, by the way, it's 35 degrees Celsius is the conversion. Okay. 95 Fahrenheit equals 35 Celsius. So I'm able on my dehydrator, I'm able to set it to, to that. Okay? okay. And so I just put the jar with the lid in there and the dehydrator keeps it perfectly at that temperature. But I do go over some other ways that you can maybe hold your milk at that temperature in, in my recipe. So um, I'm just gonna open it up here and hold it up to the screen. I think it's back in ferments. All right, so this is, there are alternate ways to make yogurt if you don't have um, a dehydrator to keep it at 95 degrees or Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. So if you have a cooler, you can heat it up on the stove. You need a thermometer though, to get the temperature exactly right. And then heat it up on the stove and just put it in like a cooler, wrap some towels around it. Um, so there are, what, sometimes what, your what, oven. Hmm? Okay, that page, page number. Um, well, it's page 64 of the printed book. But like I said, I think really people in Nigeria should be getting this as an ebook, so. Okay. Page 64, got it. Just for, just for those who may have it already. Okay. Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so probiotics. So, so, so that, that's a way to multiply what you already have. So is that, am I understanding you correctly? Open up the pills, put them in the milk. Just one. Sick. All you need is one. You don't need much. One okay. pill will, will definitely do like a whole mason jar, probably more. So. Yeah. Oh, okay. So you, and then you let it sit for how long? Like, so it's 24 hours at 95 degrees Fahrenheit or 35 degrees Celsius. Okay. okay. The principle yeah. there is that for people who are following the SCD, the specific carbohydrate diet, you're trying to get rid of all the lactose because lactose gives a lot of people digestive problems, especially right? lactose African, intolerance. Especially African Africans, we, 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 they say up to 75 percent of us are lactose intolerant. Yeah. So. Yeah. So if you, if you turn your milk into yogurt, then the lactose is gone. If you do it this way, the 24 hours, make sure that all the lactose has been consumed. Okay. Okay. So. Yeah. Perfect. This has been a lot of good stuff, Prof. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We still have to go and deal with the other minor um, topics here and there, like the zinc and, uh, and uh, what else? Magnesium. We've got to talk about magnesium and a few other things, but. I'm sure we'll be able to pick them up from time to time, right? You got it. Be my pleasure. Awesome. Thank you so much again. And folks, thanks for joining us. And we will see you guys 
next week.